Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Oh, it's great to be here, Christopher. Good to see you, buddy. Likewise. Hey, I'm excited to unpack a really familiar experience to many uh, people with us today, which is navigating what's next in life in the midst of uncertainty and anxiety. And Jeff, this was your story. I'd love for you to start by taking us back as a primer to today's conversation. What happened? Sure. Well, uh, September of 2020, I, I don't know if you remember this, but there's actually this thing called a global pandemic going on. So, uh, you know, making a, <laughs> making a career move during the middle of a global pandemic or wh wherever we are in the season of that um, was a challenge. But, you know, we, Wendy and I have been processing this for over 18 months that we were becoming empty nesters. And 18 months before this, I have a personal advisory board and they were asking me, what do you think your life's going to be like when you become empty, an empty nester? And I'm, I said, well, I haven't even thought about it. And they said, well, you should. And th there's a whole other principle I to unpack there in terms of having wise counselors in your life. But that really began the process of us thinking, what do we, what do we want to do? And, and what do we think the season looks like? And so that, you know, began a kind of a familiar journey for us, Christopher, in the sense that we've made four, I've made, you know, if you look at my career, I've made four big career moves within the last, 25 years, moving from Chick-fil-A to starting a church to then leaving that church. I started starting two other churches to leaving that in September of 2020 to go serve a broader collection of businesses and churches. And what I discovered is that there were some principles that I could use to make the best decision. But what the, I also discovered is that I never could eliminate the risk, but I could shrink the risk. And so this whole career decision, we, we got to the point where we thought, you know what, I can't let fear drive this. I have to let wisdom, but at some point, courage has to be in the driver's seat as well. So if somebody's trying to figure out a career move, um, I've not only have I been there, I'm still in the midst of it, right? I mean, just it, it, it's, I'm still in the, you know, the two, two year window of this. And uh, there's every day is a new day and every day has challenges and ups and downs and but it's all worth it as long as you you've got some wise counselors um, and you're you're moving as, as as well as you can with courage and wisdom. Go back to what you were saying about having a personal advisory board because for the folks joined with us today who are facing uncertainty and insecurity about decision making in and of itself. This is the the paralysis by analysis, the paralysis of indecision. Mm -hmm. Number one, what are the benefits of this personal advisory board in your life and how did you build it and how should we build it? Because it's a huge Absolutely. game changer, I think. Well, there's a biblical principle and what, no matter what somebody thinks about the Bible, this principle is true, whether, you know, just because it's from the Bible, but uh, in the, the book of Proverbs, it says plans fail for lack of counselors, but with many advisors, plans succeed. And uh, several years ago, I heard Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, talk about a personal advisory board. And he said, you know, Coca-Cola has a, an advisory board and they're just selling sugar water. You have your one and only life. You should probably have an advisory board too. And I got so convicted about that, especially from somebody who lives in Atlanta that loves Coca-Cola. And I'm like, all right, I love Coca-Cola, but I can't, I can't let them be more passionate about sugar water than I am about my, you know, one, one and only life. And so I began just to do the hard work of asking who would I want, if I actually had a board, who would I want it to be? And I wanted it to be someone who's someone who's older someone whose kids were older than my kids, someone who refer, that was further down in my career so that they, they could look back. And I, you know, I looked at them and I respected their marriage. I respected their career. I, I respect, respected their kids. I respected how well they took care of themselves physically. And I'm like, okay, when I grow up, I want to be you someday. So I approached four men in our church and said, would you be on my personal advisory board? To which they said, what is a personal advisory board? So I'm, I'm kind of making this up as I go along, right? But again, I thought if, if I was working at Coca-Cola, I would take this seriously. I would have an agenda. I would have, you know, some specific directions and some specific questions because I know the better questions you ask, the better answers you find. And uh, so I just, and the biggest challenge was get out your calendars and let's see if we can find uh, a Friday morning once a month or, or depending on how you know, what's going on, it may be more than once a month. So that's what I've done. And this has been something that I've done for 18 years. And it has been just life defining in so many ways. My wife, Wendy, will come to one of these meetings once a year um, just to check in and for them to ask her, 
hey, how's Jeff doing? And how's, you know, how's, how are things at home and, and all of that? And particularly as it relates to this last decision, she was meeting with us on a regular basis because this wasn't my decision. This was our decision. And um, so finding the people that you want to be on your board um, and, and then taking it seriously, getting out your calendar and then going, what are some, what are some questions that, that you would ask? And so specifically in the agenda, I would come with three questions that I was processing. Um, what am I excited about? Um, what am I nervous about? And here's the things that I'm currently doing. Could you give me some advice on, on this? And, uh, and sometimes they would bring the agenda. Sometimes, Christopher, I would come with something that I was really bothered about. And just saying the words out loud was such a gift to another human being. Because sometimes when you do that versus mm-hmm. just letting it bottle up, you, you know this from an emotional health standpoint, just getting the words out sometimes releases the power that keeping it internal has on you. And, um, and sometimes I would say these words and I, as the words were coming out of my mouth, I would think, why am I bothered by this? This isn't that big of a deal. Sometimes when the words came out of my mouth, my board would say, whoa, 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 you, you need to pay attention to that because if I were you, that would bother me as well. Um, and, and for our listeners, don't fall into the, to, to the trap of thinking, well, I'm not the CEO of this or I'm not the CEO of that. No, you're, you're the leader. You lead you. You know, and uh, this is a self leadership opportunity. Now, it's going to take work, and I and I I actually challenge people when I talk about this, Christopher, because they're really intrigued by really, you know, oh, how'd you do this? How'd you do this? And then I'll, and they'll, I think I'm going to do this someday, and then I'll just look at it and say, you know, honestly, chances are, odds are, you're not going to do anything with this, because this is an, an important but not urgent thing. At some point, it will be urgent, but it's not urgent now. And the challenge with making a career move or career change is suddenly it becomes urgent. Well, for your, for your listeners that, you know, you, they may think, you know, I don't think I might make a career change within the next 30 days, but I might someday in the next two or three years. This is why a, a, a personal advisory board to me is both important and urgent because where a lack of counselors plans fail. So I just need as much wisdom um, you know, as I told my board, um, me is not as smart as we, and I need your, I need your help. In fact, I'm having breakfast this, uh, in a few days with one of my advisory board members and, you know, I'll get together with them one-on-one. So this whole idea of wise counselors has been just a game changer for Wendy and me. How did you know you were collecting a group of counselors and not just cheerleaders? I knew these guys cared enough about me to be honest with me. And the, these, were, these were not fans, they were not foes, but they were friends. They cared about Wendy, they cared about me, they cared about our kids, and they cared enough to shake their head and go, you're wrong. Or they cared enough to say, shake their heads and go, yes, you're right. And, and, and they just, they genuinely cared for me. And they're, they were emotionally healthy people as well. They had no agenda. There was no agenda of there, there was nothing in this for them to gain, you know, uh, other than a free breakfast. But half the time they would pay. So, you know, it's really a win win. So but I just knew that I could trust them. The other thing is, from my perspective, this is such a gift for me. But my wife just can sense that these are the right people. And when she met these guys and she knew these guys, she's like, absolutely. These are the guys that if you ever do grow up, Jeff, I want you to be like these guys. And just knowing you know, their families, their wives, who they are, how they've handled themselves. Um, like I've had some people say, well, you know, my per- I've got a personal advisory board and they're folks all my same age. And I'm like, maybe, I mean, you know, you can make this up. There's no fast rule. But for me, no, I want somebody that's got a track record of their kids are older. Um, they're, they've been married longer. They've been in business longer. They just have more life experience so they can turn around and tell me, don't do this. Yes, do that. But I, I knew that I could could trust them. Confidentiality. Um, obviously, I, I was a pastor at this point, so confidentiality was um, uber important, and mm. I never had to worry about that. Mm. Jeff, you said early on that your identity took a hit in the process of making a major change in your life. Now, we talk about identity a lot here on the podcast, but I'd love to know how so. 
when you go to a party or you go out, you know, you meet somebody for the first time and they'll, you know, Hey, what's your name? My name's Christopher. My name's Jeff. Oh, Hey, nice to meet you. What do you do? Well, your identity or your, you know, the answer to that question changes in the midst of a 24 hour time frame. I mean, this last move, I, I can no longer say, well, I'm the lead pastor of Gwinnett church. And if people lived in Atlanta, they would go, Oh yeah, I've heard of Gwinnett church. And then now I would say, I would have this kind of meandering description like, well, you know, I wrote this book, you know what you're for. And so I go travel around and speak. And then, you know, as I'm trying to explain this, I'm in the, in the back of my mind, fear and uncertainty are going, are you kidding me? Um, Cause this is what I tell people. I said, you know, all of us talk to ourselves, only the brave of us actually admit it out loud. So, you know, in, in the back of my mind, the, my mind's going, this is going to be a total, you can even quickly describe this. So, um, so your identity many times is connected to who, what you've done and what you are doing. So when you make a career change or a career change is forced upon you, then you don't have an easy description to, well, here's what I'm doing. Like for, for my case, in instance, I wasn't going from one job to the next. I was going from one job to kind of starting a whole idea of trying to help organizations and, and leaders. And so your, your identity sometimes is so wrapped up in what you do that when you pull away, it's, it's actually really, it's, it's uncomfortably healthy because at some point we all will leave our current jobs, right? We will all leave our current jobs. And our last day on the job, we're one day closer after today. And I think that's why some leaders hang on too long because they may not know this cognitively, but I think somewhere in their, in, in their, spirit and being they're like gosh if i ever leave this this is what i started or i've been here for so long this is who i am i just don't know how i could what my identity would be those words may not they may not articulate it but it's somewhere in the midst of them and so that's a dangerous place to be because if if we are what we do we won't when we stop and when we stop doing that um we stop being that person and that is a part of who you are, but it should not be who you are completely. And that's why I think even thinking about what to do next is healthy because it is coming for all of us. You know, before we recorded, I told you leading up to my decision of leaving Gwinnett church, a mentor, another mentor of mine, who's not on my personal advisory board, probably should be. But he said, Jeff, cause I was like, am I leaving too early? And he said, I would let, rather leave a year too early than a day too late. And I see a lot of leaders leaving too late. And I think that kind of robs them maybe of what they could be doing beyond this, because sometimes we get so wrapped up in what we're currently doing that I think it puts a lid on our potential of what we can be doing. So for example, I've been in this new season for almost two years. Christopher, I have grown immensely, um, immensely, but that's what, uncertainty require, you know, that's what uncertainty provides. You know, if you're going to grow, uncertainty and discomfort is the price that you must pay. Uh, I could have stayed where I was and it would have been fine, but I wouldn't have grown. I just would have, I've kind of done that role. I've been there, done that. And I would just be hanging on for comfort and comfort is addictive. There's nothing wrong with comfort, but comfort can be addictive if it lulls us to sleep from the uncertainty and discomfort that comes with growth and moving forward. Stay there if you if you would, Jeff. I want to put a pin in leaving early versus leaving late and, and, and talk about that in a moment. But you had said, rather, you had made the connection between uncomfortable, discomfort, and healthy, it being healthy. Then you just said, if you're going to grow, uncertainty and discomfort are part of the game. I, I want to know more about that because um, a few of us probably bristled when we heard you say that. And I know we get it theoretically, but man, when the rubber meets the road, how do we do it? How do we embrace it? How do we walk in it? Because it's hard. Oh, absolutely. And I think when, when, when I talk to people, they're like, how do you, how do you eliminate the risk yeah. of what if it doesn't work? And my response is you don't eliminate the risk. Mm. It's, you, it's, it's impossible to completely eliminate the risk. You can, but what you can do is you can reduce the risk. You can shrink it. So let me give you an example. Yes. When I left Chick-fil-A to help start Buckhead Church or be a part of the early days of Buckhead Church, 
Buckhead is a part of North Point Ministries Church in Atlanta, one of the largest churches in America. Well, Buckhead was a video, one of the first video venue churches where the preacher would be on video. Um, well, in today's world, that's very common. But back in the day, 20 years ago, this was kind of unheard of. So I was leaving a multi-billion dollar company hmm. to go start a church where the preacher's on video. So imagine me trying to explain this to my in-laws and parents, you know, because I had a really strong trajectory going on at Chick-fil-A. They, in fact, unbeknownst to me, when I hmm. was about to resign, they uh, offered me a promotion and a huge pay raise. So, um, so all that, you know, is swirling. So I, the risk was still there. There was a good chance Buckhead Church would not work. But we had done the due diligence of looking at my skill set. We had done the due diligence of understanding is this is is this in line to where where Wendy and I feel like we should be. We had done the due diligence to get ourselves financially ready. Mm. That as a result, I mean, we had to take a massive pay cut. We were able, we were in a financial position to make, to wither that financial pay cut and keep moving forward. We had done a lot of the work that I write about in the book. So that when the time arrives and next arrives, we are ready. And that's why I, you know, when, when people are saying, well, I'm not, I don't see a career move happening, you know, within the next 30 days, but I could see it in two to three years. And they think two to three years is so far off. But from my perspective, I'm thinking, no, 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 you got to get to work now. Okay. What's your financial situation? Can you create a side hustle? What is your network in terms of the people that you know? Have you done the due diligence to understand what your strengths are? And are you are you leaning into that? Are you maximizing every opportunity in your day job? Because your dream mm. job is usually found through your day job. And if you do all of that, what I write about in the book, you can shrink risk and uncertainty. But the reality is it might not work. And so the reality mm. for me is Buckhead Church there was a risk that it would not have worked, but I did everything I could to give it a shot. And the thing that helped the most is I was so intrigued about the possibility of Buckhead Church that it kind of ruined my current opportunity at Chick-fil-A mm. because I thought, you know, if Buckhead Church works and we can create kind of a video venue church, we could spread these things around the country and around the world, which is actually what ended up happening. Um, and on my subsequent career moves, that's been the same thing. I was mm. so intrigued about what was next that it kind of ruined that current opportunity. And I thought, you know, if, if I don't do this, I'm going to regret it. But if we're looking for, you know, a, a thousand percent bet, no doubt it's going to work. Uh, if we're looking to eliminate risk completely, I just don't think we live in that world. But from my perspective, you don't have to leap over the Grand Canyon for your next move. You can, but it, you, you can shrink it to uh, a mud puddle. There's mm -hmm. chances are you might get wet and you might get muddy, but you're not plunging thousands of feet below, you know? And uh, so if Buckhead Church and Gwinnett Church, and if this current thing doesn't work, we've done the due diligence to know, okay, we, we will pivot and move something and, and, and keep moving. And so um, if you're looking for certainty, to be the decision factor, the ultimate decision factor, you're probably just going to stay where you are. Mm, okay, then. Take us under the hood of your mental and emotional health in that season of change because I can, I can hear my friends talking at me in the background going, yeah, but what about anxiety? <laughs> what about the sense of hopelessness if it was there? What about this? What about that? During the season of change, Jeff, how was your mental and emotional health challenge? Like, what was your day to day like in that space? Let me take you back to a, a real pivotal day for me. So, I hired a transition consultant, which is a, a fancy word for therapist. Okay. But basically, he helps people with transitions. And it was some of the best money that I've spent uh, mm. in a long, long time. So, I. Let me give you a perspective. So mm -hmm. leaving Gwinnett Church, this is a church that I started. This is a church I named. This is So I hired everyone. We had two Gwinnett Church locations at the time. Uh, I loved it. I loved the people there. This was not coworkers. This was family, right? And so it was very difficult leaving because you feel like you're leaving people. But, but at the same time, Wendy and I felt like, no, this is our next season. We need to do this. 
So I'm at home one day and I get a call. They say, Jeff, could you come speak at this thing? And, uh, you know, and it was just a great opportunity. It was awesome. And this was actually one of the, one of the, this is exactly one of the reasons I left Mm -hmm. is because I would, you know, I get calls like this, but I couldn't go pursue them because I had a day job, right? I had two churches to lead. So I could go be, you know, I could go occasionally, but something like this, I would just typically have to say no. Mm -hmm. So I thought, Absolutely. This is a huge opportunity. Really early on, I hang up the phone, take a few steps, and then just double over in grief to my to my knees because I was just overcome, overcome by the grief of leaving. So on one hand, I was really excited about this opportunity that I just got a phone call on. On the other hand, I was still grieving the loss of not being the pastor and coworker of friends and you could already, and this is no one's fault. It's just the flow of work that you go from talking to some people every day or almost every day for 17 years to only hearing from them every once in a while, uh, mm-hmm. because it's just like the flow of work. Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine said, Hey, you got off the Gwinnett church train and they had to keep moving cause they got to keep going and you're waiting for your next train to show up. Right. So I, I tell my transition consultant, I said, okay, am I losing my mind? Because in the span of like 30 seconds, I went from euphoria to grief. And I went from joy to grief. What in the world is happening to me? Uh, And he just laughed and said, no, Jeff, the emotionally healthy person can hold joy and sorrow at the same time. And that's Mm. what you're doing. You're holding joy and sorrow at the same time. And I would tell you that's been my journey for the last two years holding joy and sorrow at the same time. I mean, there are things that I miss about my previous job. There are people that I miss, all the people there I miss. And yet at the same time, this morning, I had a phone call with something that's brand new that would not have been there if I had not, Mm. you know, let go of that previous thing to open up to this new thing. And that's the challenge that you know, I, I tell folks, this is a challenge. I understand this. I'm not trying to eliminate, I mean, I'm not trying to make it sound easier than it sounds, but many times you won't be, a, you're not able to receive anything because you're not willing to let go of that current thing. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you have to let go before something is placed in that open hand. And if your hands aren't open, it's just going to bounce off those closed fists. And yes, it requires courage, but it, it really requires the, the, the hardest thing for me has not been the work, the um, building the business. The hardest thing has been just the emotional toll of of leaving a place that I loved, and and then dealing with the uncertainty. I mean, you know, you know, you're you go on this journey of like, oh, this is the direction, and then you sat, you discover, oh, that's not the direction. It's now you got to go over here, and it all morphs and changes, right? You got to be flexible, um, but. That, that's why early on, one of the best statements I heard was from one of my mentors, John Maxwell, when he said early on when he was making a similar change, mm-hmm. he was leaving his role as a pastor to be a leadership coach for, for leaders. He said this, he said, I've never had a clear vision. I just kept moving forward. Mm-hmm. And when John said that a few weeks into this new journey of mine, Christopher, I thought, oh my goodness, that's exactly what I needed to hear. I, I don't have a clear vision, but every day I get up and I keep moving forward. And as I keep moving, the vision gets more clear and more clear. But moving forward uh, does have, you know, it, it has joy and sorrow at the same time. So if you're looking for just a life of joy, um, I don't know that, that that's that's true for all of us. But I think joy and sorrow can coexist. And that's been my journey. And again, go back to the whole growth process. Uh, when I say growth, I'm not just talking about growth as a leader. I'm just talking about I just feel like I'm I'm, I'm a better person two years mm-hmm. from now, having gone through the fire of what we what any change like this will require. And I know I'm making it sound like it's just hor- horrible. It's not. It's been awesome. But I also want to paint a reality for for people that there are ups and downs to anything. But as I say in the book, sometimes the greatest risk isn't leaving. Sometimes the greatest risk is actually staying. So you have to manage that risk as well. I want to take the idea of 
holding joy and sorrow in the same place from theory to practice. And I'll even paint this picture by asking another question. How have you negotiated with the simultaneous presence of restlessness, which is, I know something has to change, hope, I believe this change will be good for my future, and fear, it simply won't fail. I am a failure. We're holding two different diametrically opposite emotions in one place. How do we do this practically, Jeff? Because this is a this is a mental health, emotional health podcast, and holding joy and sorrow is a necessary skill. As your mentor said, as a friend said, you know you're emotionally healthy if you could do this. How do we do it? Well, I think understanding you're on a you're you're on a journey and 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 to understand that let, let's take leadership for example i could have assumed that leadership yeah. is my only issue here or mm -hmm. entrepreneurship i got to build a business right so i got to mm -hmm. i got to find sales i got to find clients all of that is true but if i neglect my emotional health in the process then i will un unknowingly undermine the entrepreneurship and the leadership mm -hmm. in, in the process and um, I had to get, you know, when you're, when you're in a season like I am, recurring revenue is, is king. Um, because this is the first time in my career that I haven't gotten paid every two weeks, right? So I don't know where the money's coming from. So mm. the more that you can have recurring revenue, the better. So, you know, we're very blessed to be able to, to you know, shortly in, start to have some recurring revenue come in. When I got recurring revenue coming in, I had a choice to make. The choice was to start building this, building a team, hiring people, doing all this stuff, or focus on my own emotional health and go, wait, I got revenue coming in um, and I've got a sustainable pace. Let's start processing where I am. And so I hired uh, two counselors, two different counselors, in addition to my personal advisory board to just begin asking questions, reflecting back on um, my previous career, reflecting back on just some things that, you know, how am I processing the grief of mm -hmm. leaving and changing, uh, processing what am I worried about? Um, one of the things I was worried, you know, honestly, I had somebody come up to me uh, at dinner. You have to be careful about the people who come up to you at dinner and provide life advice, right? <laughs> and, um they said, hey, if uh, people are curious of what you're doing, if you don't let us know what you're doing in the next few weeks, they're going to forget about you. And that was true in some extent. I mean, mm -hmm. one, one mentor told me, you're going to be surprised how quickly people forget about you, right? And so that bothered me for a little bit. But then I began to ask the question, why does it bother me that people might forget about me? Mm -hmm. um, that's, I wonder if that's actually driving me to some extent that I, I want people to, I want notoriety or I want people to know what I'm doing to prove to them that this new season was successful. And I thought, that's interesting. Why does it matter to me that people actually know what I'm doing? And so that really, you know, led me to some self um, reflection um, of some things I'm just processing about. And it's been so I never thought I would, you know, in our little world in Atlanta, I would say, Christopher, just in our little bitty world where we live, you know, it's fairly recognizable. Um, but now, because I haven't been doing this role for two years, I can kind of go and go out and nobody knows who I am. And I actually thought, I'm actually enjoying that now, mm. uh, the anonymity of it. And so those kind of things are helping me, I think, be a better father, a better husband, a better friend, a better leader, a better person. And now I may get to a point where I start, you know, building a team and building and hiring people and all that kind of stuff. But that's not my goal right now. Mm -hmm. My goal is to be the best emotionally healthy version of me. Because I feel like if I'm the best emotionally healthy person of me, the leadership part of that, the entrepreneurship part of that, that'll take care of itself, right? I'll mm -hmm. figure that out. But if I'm unhealthy, it'll undermine all of that. So I've really intentionally slowed down uh and not you know sometimes as an entrepreneur once you get recurring revenue you're like all right i'm going to beat that because you want you know you know you're going to beat last year's numbers um and all that's great there's nothing wrong with that 
as for me in this process, I, I don't want to, my wife, Wendy and I, we, we say, we want to build a life that we enjoy. That's what we want to do. We want to build a life that we enjoy. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't want another mentor of mine says, do you own your business or does your business own you? And I didn't want to get to a point where the business owned me. I wanted mm -hmm. to own the business. And that means that, um, my pace is sustainable. I can hire counselors or, or just, I mean, I didn't hire my personal advisory board. They're just friends, read books that help me, um, be cognizant of, of where my emotional health is, uh, because I want to be the best version of me going mm -hmm. forward. And so for me, that was a fundamental business decision that I've made in recent months. Okay. We've got recurring revenue. I can see it. That's awesome. This has given me some margin now to do some introspective work that I probably didn't have the luxury to do early on because I had to build some revenue. It's really interesting because I've heard from so many people in the last few months about slowing down. What is it about this time in culture that there is this motivation, Jeff, to slow down and do exactly what you did? Because I want to I want to resonate with people listening who are saying feeling. <laughs> the similar thing, but they're not sure where to slot it in their heart. But I think your story just gave us um, a demonstrable evidence that yes, this should be a priority. Talk to about, talk to us about slowing down. Slowing down sounds good, but mm -hmm. it's hard. It's hard for, so the folks that are listening to your podcast, they're achievers, they are leaders and, and, and I'll just speak for us. Um, I think sometimes slowing down can seem guilty. Like what, what am I doing? I, I'm not doing anything. I'm not conquering a new hill. And mm -hmm. so, so here's the biggest thing that's happening in me right now. And, and I'm a person of faith. So I would say this is one of the things the Lord mm -hmm. is teaching me. So mm -hmm. I, I, I love Christopher to live five years out. I mean, here I, I'm a, I'm, I, I, for whatever reason, God's given me, uh, the gift of vision, to, to set vision, to see a vision, to go after it and say, that's where we're going. I can see the future. And I live in the future. And that's where I've spent most of my career saying, hey, come over here. I see where we're going in the future. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And it it was a strength of mine. It was also, Any strength is a weakness. So many times our teams that I served would have to go, hey, Jeff, we're glad you're in the future and we're glad that you're seeing trends or whatever. But um, we actually need you to Sunday's coming and we need you to help us for, with today. Right. So uh, that, that future things that not always a, 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 a gift, but as for me now, um, I think where I've been challenged spiritually is let's not do that right now. Let's don't do the five year plan. Let's just focus on today. Let's have the best today mm -hmm. you can possibly have. And then tomorrow let's get up and have the best today we can have. Um, it's actually, you know, from a, from a faith standpoint, it's actually what Jesus said. Hey, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to have enough challenges of it on. Just, just live today. Well, from a vision series standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, from a, I got to know where we're going standpoint, that seems like awful advice <laughs> with all due respect, but it's actually true. It's actually more healthy. And that's not to say that we should have a disregard. That's not to say we shouldn't plan. Right. But I think sometimes I know for me, I could get so focused on the future that I take advantage. I, 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 I don't see the opportunities of today. Hmm. So, um, Hey, do I know exactly where my business is going five years from now? No, mm -hmm. but are some, do I know what I could do today? Did I know that you and I get to hang out today on the podcast? That's going to be awesome. And you know, you're mm -hmm. helping me to, to serve leaders and, and that's awesome. That's fantastic. Um, after this, I actually have a counseling appointment that's going to help me get better. That's awesome. Uh, earlier today, I had, you know, a, a zoom call with some of our clients. And so working on an, another talk, all this kind of stuff, I'm going to focus on today. So I think slowing down and focusing on today for leaders is hard because leadership leaders are future oriented mm -hmm. and that's just leaders say, follow me. We're going there. Mm-hmm. To do that, there needs to be something to point to. And so it's uncomfortable to leaders to go, I don't know where we're going. Why don't you just follow me to today? <laughs> that's, that's a hard thing, right? But I know for me right now, I've just begun to enjoy days a little bit more by focusing and trying to leverage them more mm -hmm. 
that I know today was good, but hey, five years from now, let me tell you the trend that's going to happen. We got to work now because five years from now, it's going to happen. So I say that to say slowing down seems like it's a really easy thing. It's a really, really hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. I think if, if, if we all decided tomorrow to put a three o'clock nap on our schedules, there's something in us that on today seems good, but when it gets there tomorrow, I think there's for most of us, if not all of us, we would feel guilty about laying down at three o'clock, taking a nap. Ironically, that's exactly what Winston Churchill, one of the greatest leaders of all time did. He took a nap every single day. And so this idea of slowing down and being a gift, letting it be a gift to you so that you can be a gift to others. Uh, and it goes back to a sustainable pace. My life moves to a better place when I move at a sustainable pace. So I do, and I do think that's one of the things the pandemic has recognized for us. It's, it's caused us to reflect on life. Am I going in the direction that I mm-hmm. want to go in? And if not, can I take some changes to, um, to not miss life, to actually enjoy it. But the gift of today, you know, John Maxwell says that we, we tend to over-exaggerate how great yesterday was. We tend to overestimate how, you know, great tomorrow will be. And we have a tendency to underestimate the potential of today. Mm -hmm. So slowing down actually allows us to do that, but it will require you, you know, giving up this illusion of control. And that's what I think we, we love as leaders. We love to, buy into the belief that we're in control of the future, which I think the last couple of years has proven that we're not. If there's an illusion of control, Jeff, I think one of the most dominant fears that we all have to deal with is the fear of losing control, which then causes us to self-protect, to self-promote, to adopt an independent spirit, to plow through um, at an unsustainable pace so that we don't have to slow down and look in the mirror and deal with things like relationships and, and hard things like that. Um, any more thoughts on exactly that? So when I left Gwinnett Church for 30 days, I took 30 days off to kind of decompress, to, to just to do nothing. And it was really, really hard. I guess, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's hard to, to not do anything, you know, but I, I wanted to, I wanted to feel the feelings. And so one of the things as leaders, I think that we don't do well enough is we don't feel the feelings. We don't feel, we don't let the, the feelings of, of fear just, you know, wash over us and we try to deny it. Uh, we don't let the fear of anxiety, um, we don't, we don't recognize it. We just try to fight it off, even though we're, we know it's there or whether it's depression or um, worry or whatever it may be. And what I've come to realize is I've got to, what I've come to realize is I got to let that emotion just go through me to recognize, okay, I'm, this is how I'm feeling uh, and to recognize it and to go, that's, that's interesting. Why am I feeling like that? Um, I have understood the difference between examining how I feel and dwelling on how I feel. Um, dwelling is just constantly being consumed by whatever that emotion is, examining it and not judging myself and not shaming myself and going, why do I feel that way? Why, it, you know, why, why am I, why, why am I anxious or why am I worried or why am I somewhat depressed? What is it that, and just to be more curious about the situation, um, that has been such a gift in this season, just to examine it, not to dwell on it and, and, and not to, not to judge myself on how I'm feeling, but just to recognize it. And once you recognize it, it kind of loses its, a lot of its power on you because you're recognizing it and you're dealing with it. Um, it's kind of like one of my counselors says, put yourself uh, put that part of you that's anxious or fearful, put up, put that person in a chair and listen to what that person has to say. The anxious you, the fearful you, the jealous you, the envious you, the whatever you, let that voice be heard. What are they saying? And that's been such a gift as well. Because once I, you know, it's, it's much like when I would talk to Wendy and go, you know, I'm scared about what if we don't get the revenue that we need? And she just would smile and she goes, that's the last thing I'm worried about. Uh, based on your track record, based on your network, based on, you know, who you are, that's not going to be the issue. And just to be able to have that conversation and examine that fear was so helpful. Um, so 
that's why this whole idea and that's why what, what you're doing is so important. Um, you know, the emotional health, emotional awareness uh, of leaders is so, is so important, especially if you're going to make a move like this, because it's all the, all the feels, <laughs> all the emotions come out in a transition like this. So when I hear resignation nation, when I hear, you know, people, 4 million people left their jobs last, last month to just go do whatever it's, it's, I understand it because I'm in that number, but I just want to sit everybody down and go, Hey, the grass isn't always greener. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have left, but it means that you've invited yourself into a season of discomfort and uncertainty, which is not a bad thing. Because what you've also invited yourself into is a season of growth. But when you have bad days, when you, when you feel that discomfort, when things don't go according to plan, you need to have a battle plan. You need to have a plan in place to help you through this. And that's, that's why I wrote the book. I mean, basically, it's here's my battle plan for, for moving through this. Um, here's how I made the decision. Here's, here's how I weathered the decision, how I felt like the decisions we were able to make we thrived in. Um, and, but at the same time, we didn't stay stuck anywhere. Uh, we kept moving forward. And, and that's what, I, that's exciting for me. That's, you know, 4 million people each month have left their jobs because there's probably something in them that felt like they were being mm-hmm. stifled. And if you feel stifled, eventually your soul withers. But at the same time, mm-hmm. I wanted, I wanted to help give people a, a plan of action so that they can deal with the uncertainty and the fear and the discomfort that is inevitably coming your way. It's coming your way. Don't be surprised, but don't be afraid of it. Don't be surprised. Don't be afraid of it. Prepare for it. So Jeff, let's just get clear cut here then because the majority of listeners here are not necessarily organizational leaders, but instead, like John Maxwell teaches, leadership is not title or position, but it's influence. So All of us have a sphere of influence in our lives, whether it's in a family or um, a small group or whatever that may be. Change is inevitable. So I want to put this equation together. How did you know and how do we know when it's time to make a change? What are some warning signs, some some bells that are going off that we should pay attention to? Mm -hmm. Such a good question. And there's there's a lot of answers to that. So... But I'll give you a a few things. Again, this whole idea of wise counselors and wise advisors bringing that to me and going, hey, what are you and Wendy thinking about with your empty nesting years? I'm like, oh, wow, I haven't thought about that. Okay, so they brought that issue to me. So who is speaking into your life? Um, Who are you listening to? Who you listen to is a preview of the future you. So are you, you know, do you have somebody that you're meeting with on a regular basis that could be speaking into your life? Are there mentors and leaders? And so that helped, that was first step. Okay. I've got some people speaking into my life and I got a green light from every single one of my mentors and advisors about this move. If I had, if I'd gotten a red light or a yellow light from anyone, I would have, um, I would have paused, but I got a green light from all of them along the way. There were still some things we needed to do. Um, And we had made this decision before the pandemic hit. When the pandemic hit, we we stretched out our season at the church just to kind of help manage that season. So we actually stayed longer at the church than we were planning. So this this idea of advisors is really, really important. Um, Side hustles, I'm a big believer in. Um, And a side hustle doesn't necessarily mean, you know, a a 20-hour-a-week part-time job. It could mean, but... Based on my Chick-fil-A background, I have people come to me all the time and go, hey, do you think I should be a Chick-fil-A operator? I'm thinking about applying to be a Chick-fil-A operator and owning my own Chick-fil-A. Do you think I should? And my response is, I don't know. But I know how you can find out. And the way you find out is to go to your local Chick-fil-A and apply for a part-time job and work nights and weekends. And because if you don't like your part-time job at Chick-fil-A, you're certainly not going to like owning the business, right? And there's so much of what I'm doing right now because of side hustles that I experimented with. Uh, One of the things I do is I coach communicators. Uh, Our brand promise on one of the businesses that I lead is we help make your next presentation, your best presentation. Well, this was a side hustle that I've been working on for about 12 years now that suddenly is, is one of our key business units. Well, that didn't start 
when, when we left Gwinnett Church, that started, you know, 12 years ago. Um, and then building your network, you know, is so important. It's one of the things that I'm shocked that leaders don't, aren't more intentional about going to lunch, going to breakfast with people, asking them the question, who do you know that I need to know? And your net work largely determines your net worth. And um, so I think advisors, side hustles, um, building your network of people that you know, and then really doing the due diligence of what are your strengths? What are, you, what are your gifts? Because so much of what I'm doing now is just tied to my strengths. You're, you're not going to see me launch a musical career now. <laughs> you're not going to see me launch my new album on Spotify. That's nowhere in my career background. But you will see me speak. You will see me write. You will see me lead. You will see me coach communicators and leaders. That is part of my background. And understanding what your strengths and talents are is, is such a huge clue to uh, to the future. And and then trying some things out. That's another thing about side hustles, trying some things out while you currently have your day job. And then the other thing is, is a financial runway. How much of a finance, if you were to leave your job today, how long could you go without a paycheck? Is it two weeks? Is it two months? Is it three months? Is it six months? What is it? And from, for Wendy and me, when we left Chick-fil-A for Buckhead Church, we didn't, we didn't know that Buckhead Church was even on the horizon. But one of the things we did early on in our marriage is we did some financial small group studies, and we got on the same page financially. We eliminated debt, and we were sitting there ready, waiting for next to arrive. One of the most heartbreaking things that I see, and I see this all the time, is when next arrives – great opportunity and yet they're not able a person is not able to pursue it because they're not in a financial position to so for example when we left chances are christopher you and i would have never met if i had not left chick-fil-a to go to buckhead church well we would not have been able to leave chick-fil-a if we had not done the due diligence in those financial small groups that we went through to be ready so that we can say, you know what, we can take a huge pay cut and still be okay because we've eliminated debt, we've, we're, we're on the same page. We've got a financial plan to do that. This takes discipline. It takes vision to go, I'm saving and eliminating debt and doing all this, but I don't even, I don't even know what I'm doing. If, if, if you're listening to this today and you're like, I think next is on my horizon, but I'm not quite sure what it is, the best thing that you can do is to get your financial house in order so that when it does arrive, when the opportunity does appear, you're able to pursue it because you've got your financial house in order. But that takes extraordinary amount of discipline. But here's what I've discovered. Once you commit to it, especially something with finances, it, it actually goes quicker than you might think. Mm. There's a life principle I want to unpack with you, Jeff. So folks, wherever you are in life, whatever decisions you feel are on the forefront of your life for your family. Jeff, you said this, we didn't sign up for easy. We signed up for worthwhile. Stunning statement, but I want to know what informs that statement and what's required of us to apprehend it and move in its direction. Hmm. So in the early days of Gwinnett Church, it was we were building a church, had huge construction challenges, huge financial challenges. Um, we actually had two staff members that were killed in tragic car accidents separately. Car wrecks. So it was just one. My dad passed away. It was just so hard. And so, you know, I'm standing up on Sundays going, the future's bright. And but then just all of these challenges. And it was so hard. And uh, I just felt. You know, I was, felt, felt myself complaining that it's just so hard. And then, I don't know, I just felt like the Lord said, yeah, I didn't call you for easy. I called you for worthwhile. And uh, I thought, oh, that's true. I mean, this, you know, this isn't, this isn't easy. I mean, you know, John Maxwell says that we have, we have uphill hopes, but sometimes we have downhill 
um, habits that take us downhill. And so I had to reframe that to go, yeah, I, I, this is, this is hard. It, it, it's, it wasn't promised to be easy. And especially when you're plowing new ground, plowing new ground, even from a farming analogy, when you're plowing up, especially, you know, uh, dirt that has been plowed before, it's hard. You know, you're plowing new ground, you're taking your territory. All of that is, is just, it's just hard. So I think just recognizing that so that it doesn't take you by surprise. They go, oh, you know, this, this never was promised to be easy. This is promised to be hard so that you're not discouraged by how difficult it is. And that allowed me just recognizing it and going, yeah, this is hard. Yeah, this is a difficult season. But we know that this was the path that we're on. That's why it was so helpful for Wendy and me in each one of these four decisions to both be on the same page. Because if Wendy had said, nope, there's no way we should leave Chick-fil-A to start this video, help start this video church thing. When we had difficult days in the early days of Buckhead Church, which we did, Wendy could have said, well, see, I told you we shouldn't have done this in the first place. But at each of these moves, it, as I mentioned earlier, it was not my decision. It was our decision. When we had those difficult days, you know, we, we could talk about it, process it, but at the end of the day, we both could look at each other in the eyes and go, but we know this is what we're supposed to do. And that gave us both a peace and a strength to, in John Maxwell's words, keep moving forward. And that's why, you know, this whole idea of, you know, we didn't sign up for easy. We signed up for worthwhile. Um, easy, if, you're, if you sign up for an easy job, you hit the snooze alarm. Uh, if you sign up for a job that has worthwhile purpose, you don't hit the snooze alarm because there's there's purpose awaiting you at work. And I want a no snooze alarm work career. I want to know, I want to create a no snooze alarm organization where there's purpose waiting on us at work. And, but if you, that sounds good, but if you're going to do this, then you have to understand that you signed up not for easy. You signed up for worthwhile. There's another tent stake that I want to make sure the folks get a hold of because, listen, guys, I know insecurity and indecision is real. It's affected me. It's affected you all. Um, Jeff, but I think it's easy to believe that clarity is the goal of this conversation. But we've already talked about this. It's not. You know, This is not about eliminating all known obstacles in order to move forward down a clear path. This is John Maxwell's words. We talked about it uh, earlier in this conversation. He said, I never had a clear vision. Why shouldn't clarity be our goal? And then talk to people like me and uh, my friends who are planners and detail people, Enneagram Ones. Talk to us. I think at some point clarity gets foggy the further out you get. Now you can have clarity about, Hey, here's the next step that we're going to. The next step is we're going to do this. This is going to be the next step. So I want to be clear where we are going. So that's what I've had to do. So right now we have a team of contractors and I'll say, Hey, we all get paid if revenue comes in. I'm not playing the game of, I'm going to pay you in hopes of revenue coming in. We're going to be a team of contractors. We find revenue and that's how we get paid. So that's clarity in terms of, if you want to sign up for this, we're going to pay you really well. None of us get paid, gets paid unless there's revenue coming in. So that's clarity that here's how our business is going to work. Um, at the same time, I, I mean, I don't have clarity. I didn't have clarity of exactly how this thing was going to work. Um, and that gave me flexibility. And I think flexibility is actually more powerful than clarity. And, and the reason being that when you go in a direction and you're like, there are, Early on, there were a couple of big opportunities that came my way. So I pursued them only to discover that they weren't. Well, we had built enough financial flexibility in our organization that I could go, okay, I'm going to have the 24 hour, what I call the 24 hour grieving rule, where I grieve and go, I can't believe it. And man, I thought this was going to work out. And then after that, I wake up and go, okay, I can't grieve on that anymore. I got to move. I got to keep moving. So that there's flexibility toward the future. And so, going, okay, what do I do now? And what am I learning? And who can I call that can help me take the next step forward? And sometimes 
clarity disguises itself. Um, and and ult- ultimately what clarity is, is fear. And it helps dissolve the fear by going, no, no, I know where we're going. I got this. Hey, no, no, nobody needs to be worried. Nobody needs to be afraid. I got this. I got total clarity. Mm-hmm. And but at the same time, that's just fear, fear, fear. Courage, in the other, on the other hand, says, I'm not quite sure where we're going. I, I know some specific next steps, and that's the ultimate direction. Um, but we're gonna have we're gonna have enough financial flexibility, and we're gonna have enough margin to to ask the question, what are we learning, and how can we apply what we're learning to help us move forward? Because the ultimate clarity for us is just to keep moving forward. And, um, and ultimately we're going to, we're going to find, find our way. Um, but sometimes clarity can box us in and force us down a direction just because we feel like we need to have clarity. And I had a friend of mine say early on, he goes, when you leave Gwinnett church, it's okay. When people ask you, what are you going to do to say, I don't know. That's okay. I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. That doesn't sound like a whole lot of clarity. But it provided clarity for me enough to go, it's okay not to know. My goal is to, is to find out. So to be curious, to be um, just to take the role of an investigator to go, this is going to be fun. I don't know where this is going, but let's see what happens. And here I am two years later, and all the stuff that we've been able to experience um, has been in large part, obviously, to God's faithfulness, but to our flexibility to bend along the way and to find our, find our way along the path. And, and I feel like that's what, that's what leaders do. They, they bend, they morph, uh, and, and they ultimately find, find their ways. Now, again, clarity is important, but you got to be careful. Is clarity actually disguised as fear? Or is it giving you some clear next steps to keep moving forward? Any quick tips or diagnosable way? that we can quickly identify, oh, that clarity is fear versus that clarity is helpful, encouraging, and beneficial for my my forward movement in life. So two things. I actually created an assessment on my website. Uh, it's called the yeah. Career Risk Assessment. And that basically gives you, it gives you a red, red light, yellow light, or green light to just to let you know where are you on the, on the risk standpoint where are you on the clarity standpoint because if you get a red light that doesn't mean you failed but it probably means that you know you're you're frustrated where you are but you don't have a plan how to get out of it and this gives you some next steps if you get a yellow light it means that you've actually maybe taken some steps but you're still not sure if you're leaving something or going to something if you get a green light that just means You've done the hard work. You've put yourself in the position. Now you have to ask yourself, is now the right time to leave? So I think that's a diagnostic tool that can, that can be, a, be, a, be of help. The other thing that can be a diagnostic tool is going to breakfast and going to lunch with people and getting their perspective Sorry. on here's where I am. Mm-hmm. If you were me, what would you do? And who do you know that I need to know? And what do I need to do right now in your perspective? And talking it, talking it out loud with other people is such a gift because you're going to refine your talking points in your mind about what you're thinking. But who knows? The person at breakfast may go, oh, you know what? I have never, I forgot. I need to connect you with this friend of mine. You would love to talk to her. So I think finding out kind of a lay of the land in terms of where you are with risk and then start working the phones and, um, and asking people to meet with you. And it's okay to, to meet with them and go, I don't even quite know what I'm asking you, but I'm, I'm feeling a sense of restlessness and I just want to process that. Here's where I am. You know, I actually love my job, but I'm still feeling a sense of restlessness. Have you ever felt this way? If so, what did you do? And, do you know somebody that I could talk to that maybe could help me in the career um, that, that, that I want to go in? So those are some tools, kind of a what to do and a who to talk to, 
um, that I think has definitely helped me in terms of trying to find what's next. I've been a I've been a student of John Maxwell since I was 11 years old, and as soon as you mentioned that question, who do you know that I need to know? I'm like, that's Maxwell, and I remember him saying that, and it's just it's amazing how pervasive his influence is over. Uh, great leaders like you and uh, develop and growing leaders like me and and I just I honor that man so much I'm so thankful for his influence and he he's the reason why I just took the deep dive in all things John Wooden and so I celebrate yeah. I celebrate him what a hero well he's the real yeah. deal he's he the is. real deal and he even at 75 I mean he's he's going at a pace and I mean, he's the ends influence. I mean, his, one of the goals he says before his life is over is he wants to see a country transformed by, by value-based leadership. I love it. And talk about it, talk about an incredible thought. So yeah, absolutely. So, but John would tell you he's learning, he's growing. He's, he's, he hasn't stopped growing at 75. Here's where I want to land with everyone. Um, one of the things I sort of, hammer hard on is willpower here on the show because I think it'll get us on the road but it just won't get us to our destinations um, it's helpful but it's not transformative and one of the threads I heard you teach us today was really this is about transformation from the inside out and this goes back to where we started today Jeff with identity um, Jeff who we are becoming isn't by our own determination nor is it by willpower we can focus on what we want we can design a plan and act, but increase isn't had in our own volition. Talk about your experience with that. Any any landing pieces of advice that you'd have as we as we land this conversation? I think this idea of where I am right now of just focusing on today, making today as as as, as helpful. Um, you know, Ed Milet just wrote a book called One More, and yes. it's basically you know, can I do one more thing today? Mm -hmm. You know. You know, he talks about his dad being an alcoholic and he asked his dad, can you, will you stay sober for the rest of your life? And his dad said, I don't know, but I can stay sober for one more day. And so this idea of, I, I'm going to, and I, I basically feel like we have willpower, at least for, let me speak on, pick on a little of me. I think I probably have will, willpower for about 24 hours, right? Yeah, um, right. Yeah. And then it, it evaporates. And so I've got to have a people group of people around me um, and that are doing life with me. I can't do life alone. And, and that's one of the things as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur that, that owns my own business now, I've been surprised by how lonely it is, right? Because I went from leading a team of 80 people to going to a coffee shop and opening up my laptop all by myself. And doing that over a number of weeks, um, Finally, a mentor of mine said, no, you have to have somewhere to go every day. You need to have somewhere to go every day where there are people, which was so helpful. So he rented a little office space for me just to have somewhere to go. And it was so, so helpful. So I got to have people around me. I need to be, uh, I need to have people that I'm being honest with about what's happening uh, in me. And then I need to make sure that I'm not working my life away, but that I'm building a life that I that I want to enjoy. Quick story. I, I found myself early on when people would call me to speak, they would say, Jeff, could you come speak? Yes. Yes, I can. Where they said, we haven't even told you the date yet. I'm like, I don't, I don't care. I, I got to build revenue. I got to go. Yes, I will come speak where. So I found myself, the, you know, the first full year doing this, just um, the fall is so beautiful in Atlanta. And uh, I found myself in a hotel room on Saturday night away from my wife. So I called her one night, it was in this November and I'm like, I'm glad to be here. I'm so honored that they asked me to speak. That's great. But I don't think I want to do this next year. I don't think I want to work my life. This isn't building a life that I enjoy. So I'm going to start saying no a lot more so I can start saying yes to more fall time with you. And that took a lot of courage, right? And it took, um, how can I make sure that that happens? Um, so, but it, 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 from a willpower standpoint, I really, I had to have a vision of, okay, in the fall of 2022, I want to spend as much time at home as possible. Um, and I want to be as emotionally healthy as possible, but I got to fight for that. I got to fight for that. And so, Having a community of people around me, podcasts that I listen to like this, 
um, leaders that I respect like you or John Maxwell or Kerry Newhoff and others that are speaking into my life. Um, and, and then, you know, making sure that my wife and I are surrounding ourselves with people that are breathing life into us and we're doing the same. So, um, but then trying to be as disciplined as I can, but not saying, because, you know, I'm from Atlanta, so we have to drink Coca-Cola and eat Chick-fil-A. I am not going to drink a Coke for the next three months, right? So it might be, hey, I'm going to take a day off and drink a Coca-Cola here in Atlanta. So, um, but for me, uh, just leveraging that, what can I do today? And what am I learning? And, and giving myself grace as I make some mistakes. Because uh, I, I can give grace to everybody else, but I uh, don't have a great track record of giving grace to myself. So letting myself make some mistakes understanding that I'm a human being, but that I'm asking the question, what am I learning and having people speak into my life? That's going to be a gift. Jeff, I'm so thankful for this conversation and we will put a link to your career risk calculator in the show notes as well. So if you want to check that out, guys go there now, but Jeff, I would love for people to stay connected to you, to your work, your fantastic follow and the the leader as well. And again, I'm so thankful for today, but I'd love for people to stay connected to you and uh, tell us how to do that. Well, they can just go to jeffhenderson.com, Christopher, and uh, we've got several free assessments, one of which is the career risk assessment. The other is uh, how to find your presenter's voice. We all have one of four voices, and that's one of the things I coach, and that's just a free test. We just provide a lot of free content so that people can access it. And yeah, and just you can follow all the socials there, but just go visit jeffhenderson.com. And um, and then also when you get the book, my cell phone number is in the book, so just text me and I'll text you back and let's, let me know how I can help you try to figure out what your next move is in life. So, um, but I, I that's, that's the hope of the book. Cause I just want to help people make the best. You don't have to figure out the rest of your life. You just got to figure out what to do next. That's awesome. Jeff, thanks for being here today. Thanks Christopher.